You're on. All right. One, uh, not another episode of Late Night from Willowdale. And uh, not really from Willowdale anymore, but we like that tagline. So, yeah. Um, so let's talk about a few issues tonight. Let's start with the U.S. Uh, election campaign. So it looks like that Trump and Clinton will be the presumptive nominees of their, both their parties. Uh, let's start with Clinton. Uh, there's been, I want to start with something that came up a couple of weeks ago when she went to a, uh, a fundraiser at uh, George Clooney's place in Los Angeles. And there's a lot of criticism, you know, hanging out with big Hollywood players and fundraising millions of dollars. And it irked me because, and Sanders people got some criticisms for this, because uh, Clinton wasn't just raising money for her political campaign, uh, Hillary for America, whatever it's called, for her presidential campaign. She was raising money for a lot of Democratic candidates, and George Clooney is a big supporter of hers and the Democratic Party. And they raised millions that night, but not just for Hillary, but also for the Democratic Party. So, so people running in Senate elections and elections for the House of Representatives or whatever will get some of this money. Uh, the Clintons have raised millions upon millions of dollars for different Democratic candidates over the years. And uh, when Sanders complains about big money in politics, and yes, he does get a lot of small donors, donor donations, it's, it's, it's really, it's nonsensical. I'm not going to say it's hypocritical or anything. It's just nonsensical. The Clintons have, are a power elite, okay? The Bill and Hillary or Billary, whatever you want to call them, are a power elite. They're the most famous couple in the United States. They're, and they know a lot of powerful people. They didn't start that way, but obviously that's the way it has, it has become. And they raise lots of money. And, it, and they're not just raising money for Hillary's campaign. They're raising money for the debt for as George Clooney said, to put more Democrats in Congress this this fall. And Clooney says, yeah, there's way too much money in politics. And that dinner raised lots of money uh, in Hollywood. But it didn't, go to, it didn't go to some Panama account or some Cayman Islands account. It went to the Democratic Party. And some of it went to Hillary's campaign for president. And some, and some of it went to the to raise money for Democrats running for Congress. So Sanders really had no complaints there. and He did back off a bit on that. And even Clooney uh, agrees that there's way too much money in politics, but he said he's a Democrat and he'll do whatever he can to put more Democrats in Congress. And of course, he wants Hillary in the White House. And so a lot of the stuff that comes out of the Sanders campaign was nonsensical. And, uh, and what bothers me about this and uh, now it's becoming a non-issue because it looks like Hillary's the nominee, uh, is that there's Bernie wasn't a Democrat. He was an independent. He complains about closed primaries. Primaries are for, you know, on the Democratic side, for people who are Democratic. You, as I said in a video a couple of weeks ago, you dance with the people that brung you. The Clintons have been Democrats for most of their lives, okay? They've raised, and they've raised lots of money for other Democrats. They've, they've been loyal to the Democratic Party. They went all out for Obama in 2008 and in 2012, and uh, they often credit Bill Clinton's barnstorming speech at the convention in 2012 that really helped him re get reelected. So the Clintons are true Democrats, and whatever you want to say about them, they dance with the party that brung them. So Clint, uh, Sanders is a bit of an interloper. He's running on the Democratic side, but he's basically an independent. So he really can't complain about the process and any of that. So. And, I mean, I, this is a kind of a non-issue now because it's she looks like she will be the nominee. And he's backed off from a lot of this. So um, and so I'm not going to belabor this, but, you know, it, it, then it goes back to what I said earlier about Abby Lewis and Omi Klein, who apparently only became New Democrats before that Edmonton convention. Uh, they weren't, they're not real party stalwarts. And, you know, you get tired of interlopers in part, who've never really been part of the party and then they they get involved the last minute and yeah so I you, you know people who have been involved in a party process for many many years are the ones should have influence it doesn't always have doesn't always happen that way <clears throat> Thomas Mulcair was basically a transactional player as I said he was brought in basically to to win the prime minister to win put the NDP in power and it didn't happen so uh 
and so yeah, that's there are similarities, but I I always agree with what Brian Mulroney said. You dance with the people that brung you, and if a loyal party style where these are the people who have influence in a party, the people who have been with the party, and not people who come in at the last minute. My big criticism of Bob Ray was he joined the Liberal Party just before he ran for the leadership in 2006. That was stupid. He should have joined the Liberal Party many years later, after he left the NDP in the mid-90s, uh, or late 90s. He should have joined the Liberal Party. He just joined before the 2006 federal leadership, that the, the leadership thing. And uh, that, that's, and I can understand why a lot of Liberals rejected him. He almost won the leadership of 2006. But uh, a lot of people thought, well, you know, you're an interloper. You're a New Democrat for most of your life, and all of a sudden you're a Liberal. Don't get me wrong, Bob Ray kept that party together and allowed Justin Trudeau to do what he did, and the, the Trudeau liberals haven't treated him that well. But I always thought, you know, you know, Bob Ray, you should have joined the liberals a lot earlier than you did, uh, and you would have had more legitimacy, and you probably, if you had, you might have actually won that 2006 convention that brought Dion, you know, elected Dion, and that was a disaster, and of course, the Natty took over, and that was a disaster, and and Ray was left to pick up the pieces, and he did a great job as interim leader, and that allowed Justin Trudeau, and you know the rest is history. Um, so, but I'm not going to ramble on this point. But it does go back to Bernie Sanders being an independent, running for the Democratic nomination, and he cries all these injustices. When I'm sorry, you're not a true Democrat. You're an independent. You might bring a lot of new faces to the Democratic Party, but you're still not. A Democrat, and you haven't raised a lot of money for Democrats. So uh, there's a reason a lot of Democrats don't like you. So and don't trust you. So, anyways, it's all nonsensical now because Hillary is going to be the nominee, and so uh, and that's. But I just wanted to say, like, she's ra her and Bill have raised a lot of money for the Democratic Party. So you know, if anyone has a right to be the nominee of that party, it's her. So. Uh, now, going back to the race with Donald, uh, there was a column in the Star the other day by Tom Walkman saying that, you know, and others agree that Donald could be a formidable candidate against Hillary. I just don't see it, frankly. I agree with Bob Beckel, a veteran Democratic strategist, who said recently on CNN, she will crush him. She will crush him. Yes, because he will self-destruct. I mean, he's, he's boorish and nutty and wacky behavior, his comments... They're just going to get worse. He'll not be more presidential, as people have said. He's just, he can't be. And he's already said nasty things about Hillary, about, you know, she's only there because she's a woman. It's only going to get worse. And he'll play to his base, a lot of whom hate women, and certainly hate smart, intelligent women. And he's, he's, he will self-destruct. And Hillary, Hillary just has to stick to policy, okay? Just the facts, just the facts. Just stick to policy. Uh, I don't agree with Hillary on a lot of things. Some of the stuff, you know, she that she she is very hawkish in foreign policy, uh, but she's smart and she's on the right side of history in many ways. He and a lot of American, particularly American women, want a woman in the White House, and he's just going to get nastier and more vicious, and he doesn't know anything. His speech on foreign policy in Washington the other day was a joke. It was incoherent. It was. It, it didn't make any sense. Uh, a, middle, a middle school student could have delivered a better speech on U.S. foreign policy. The guy doesn't know anything. So Hillary could destroy him. If, and if the Clintons re resurrect their war room that they did in 1992 against uh, uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, yeah, they, they could destroy this guy. I don't think he stands a chance against the Clinton machine. They're very bright, a lot of bright people behind Clinton, and she's very bright herself, and frankly. She will crush him uh, in the general election. And a lot of Republicans, a lot of Republican women will vote for her. They'll hold their noses and vote for her because they don't want him in the White House. And he's not going to get any better, okay? So uh, I don't see a better Donald Trump. That's who he is. He's a boorish sort of, he's, a, he's an entertainer. Uh, he doesn't know a lot, and he's not going to get any better. American politics is so clown. I have to admit it. It's the, on the Republican side, and I've said this before, it's, it's beyond the pale, and everyone, of course, around the world sees it, and they can't believe it. And, and uh, I don't think we've ever seen anything like it. And the problem is Donald Trump 
He's probably the smartest guy in, in a field of Republican candidates that were so stupid and scary. Is Ted Cruz, I mean, they're all, they all could be villains in a Bond movie. Ted Cruz is like Dr. No. Uh, like, he reminds me of Dr. No every time I see him. He's so creepy. Uh, and Donald Trump is Goldfinger, right? Um, so, I could just see him saying that to Hillary. You know, you know uh, that famous line from Goldfinger? And when Bond says, what do you want? And uh, uh, Do you want me to talk? And Goldfinger says, no, Mr. Bond, I want you to die. And that's probably what he thinks of Hillary. So, yeah, Goldfinger, uh, the Bond, the Republican field is full of Bond villains. Anyways, enough from American politics. Uh, Hillary will win and it'll all be fine. Uh, she's not, she's got the, I never understood the hatred towards Hillary Clinton and the Clintons in general. Although Bill, you know, post-presidency was is probably considered one of the most popular politicians in the United States, or ex-politicians. Hillary, the hatred towards her, I never understood it. I never got it, and it's uh, it's not rational. I, I just don't see it. I don't. She's a smart woman, and if you ever watch her testimony between those, the, at those Benghazi things and uh, the Benghazi testimonies in at Congress, the last one a few months ago, and the one. Just as she was leaving off at Secretary of State's office, she's so on top of the facts. She is so on top of stuff. So I mean, those debates between her and Trump will be will be absolutely fascinating. But she will destroy him as long as she sticks to the facts and doesn't get detracted by his insults and nastiness and viciousness. She will destroy him. And uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, he's come a long ways, Trump. No one expected him to come this far, but yeah. The Republican field was weak and nutty and creepier and scarier than him. But she is smart and the Clintons are they are a powerful machine and they're full of bright people there. So. Anyways, going on to Canadian politics. You know, this, this thing we didn't address in the last video, but out of Wapiscott and all the crises in Native communities across the country, Canadians get jaded because it's been going on for so many years. A hunt for a long time. I've often thought incrementally, going back to Hillary Clinton, by the way, Hillary Clinton was asked in an interview, when I think when her book came out, Hard Choices, a few years ago. She says that during, uh, when she was Secretary of State, she talked to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, and of course, Netanyahu couldn't bring himself around against an overall settlement with Palestinians. He really didn't want it. But she said, why don't you make the lives of Palestinians easier? Ease up on the blockades, ease up on all sorts of things, the restrictions that they face. Make their lives easier, and then they will hate you less. And it's better for everyone. Incremental things you could do to improve the lives of Palestinians. If you don't believe in the overall settlement, two-state solution, whatever, just make their lives easier. And each, she recalls telling Netanyahu this, obviously he didn't care. But I thought, I'm a big fan, I'm an incrementalist, and I thought with all the things going on in the Native communities across the country, the crisis in, in uh, Aboriginal and Indigenous communities, reserves, make their lives easier. Why can't we have a goal, uh, a one goal? Provide fresh drinking water to all these communities. Provide fresh drinking water to all these communities. Why can't we just do one small thing to all these communities? We have the money, come on. It's, it's embarrassing in a country that has 7% of the world's fresh water, uh, more fresh water than any other country on the planet Earth, that there are communities in this country that don't have, fresh, don't have clean drinking water. You know, there are a lot of flints out there, you know. And, yeah, so small things. Why not so the Liberal government, along with the provincial governments, make things within, they could do it in a couple, within a year probably. Put the money in there and make sure there is every Aboriginal, Indigenous community has fresh drinking water. It could be done. It probably could be done for a hundred million dollars, like, or you know, a billion dollars. It could be done, and it could be done. One small thing can't resolve all the issues, obviously, but small things improve people's lives. Fresh drinking water would be one of them, and I'm sure we could do it if we put our minds to it. So I'm not an incrementalist, and I said that so about you know problems on you know the signal problems on Toronto subway. Get the small things done before you have all these grand visions of the subway expansion and transit expansion. Get the small things done. So incrementalism is 
is the way to go. Okay, small, Rome wasn't built in a day, and get the small things done, whether it's for the Palestinians, for indigenous people in Canada, or for, or for beleaguered transit users in Toronto. Um, so anyways, uh, I'm going to end this uh, going on Canadian politics. Yeah, I'm getting a little tired of Trudeau, and uh, I, you know, I'm just getting tired of the photo ops and all the, I, you know, I, I, the Saudi thing, the Saudi deal, I understand jobs in London and all that, but the way Stefan Dion, who I never liked, as I mentioned earlier when he took the liberal leadership, the way he dissembled, too, you know, when he was confronted that, you know, he could, they, they could, they could have stopped it. And I understand why they didn't and all that, but they could have. And they lied. And he dissembled. And, you know, it reminded me, and others have mentioned this too, that famous, and he said he had no options. Well, he did have an option. He could have denied the export permits. It reminded me of what John Turner said to Brian Mulroney in that famous 1984 debate uh, when Trudeau had sat, when Justin's father had saddled John Turner with all these patronage appointments to the Senate. And uh, John Turner said, well, I had no option. And Brian Mulroney said, well, you, sir, yes, sir, you did. You had an option. You could have said no. And Stefan Dion could have said no to the Saudi deal. He had an option. It wasn't a done deal. He could have denied the export permits. And it realizes me again, you know, the sleaziness of the liberals. I never liked Stefan Dion. I never trusted him. The whole Kyoto thing when he's environment minister, that was a fraud. I mean, the guy's a fraud, in my opinion. And his foreign affairs minister is an embarrassment. So... And he had an option to stop it. And it goes to show you the sleaziness of the liberals. And I think they are slowly... The same thing, you know, with that of Wapiscat. You know, Trudeau should have gone there. He didn't. He should... I don't see a lot of things happening. Uh, yeah, the, I don't see a lot of things happening on this file. And, and, and uh, there's a chance for him to actually make a real mark. But I, I don't, he's too busy flying to New York. He loves going... He, he's too busy... He loves the photo op, hanging out with international leaders and stuff. I, I just think this guy is a bit of a fraud. I, I, and um, I'm getting tired of it. And there's for lots of other examples. And I uh, just, uh, yeah, hope and change. Yeah, not so much. Sunny ways, not so much. So um, there's probably other things I want to say. And that now we've gone on 17 minutes. I wanted to only go on for a few, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we just wanted to do a video. I haven't uh, uh, talked in a while, and uh, yeah, we'll see where the the U.S. presidential race goes. But yeah, I'm. I think Hillary Clinton will definitely in November be the next president of the United States, barring some calamity. And uh, yeah, I can't think of uh, anything else to say right now. Talk about your hair. That's all right. <laughs> just let's just get, blonde hair. Yeah, let's just end it. Um, there's other things we could say, but cl we want to do a quick video tonight. Uh, so, okay. and there were those points I wanted to raise. So. Okay, uh, uh, Kunichiwa. Kunichiwa.